Thank you very much for the, the introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here to present. I was going to put a conflict of interest slide in my presentation, but then I realized I work for Policy Canada. I am the conflict of interest. So I figured I'd just qualify myself that way. So I'm not going to get into this in, uh, in too much detail. This was already covered by David Jenkins, but these are tables from the latest iteration of the Nutrient Guidelines from Diabetes Canada demonstrating pulses and their possible effects or their effects on the management of diabetes, specifically in A1C, cardiovascular, di cardiovascular disease risk, as well as a decrease in um, um, cardiometabolic risk factors. And there de seems to be a, a beneficial effect of pulses specifically. And then when we look at dietary patterns used for the management of diabetes and cardiovascular disease risk factors, um, most of these dietary patterns in some form include pulses or legumes in general within, uh, within their recommendations. And the effects on A1C and other advantages mirror what we see uh, with pulse consumption. Various mechanisms of action have been proposed within the literature regarding the effects of pulses on the management of disease. Pulses are very uh, nutrient-dense foods, or considered to be nutrient-dense foods. And just to call out some specific dietary components that could be having an effect, dietary fiber, a source of plant-based protein, perhaps uh, increased consumption of non-heme iron as a displacement of heme iron, high levels of potassium, decreasing the sodium and potassium ratio of dietary patterns, and obviously pulses are inherently low glycemic index foods. However, there seems to be a shift internationally from talking specifically about um, healthy diets and the effects on uh, cardiometabolic outcomes to sustainable healthy diets. And I think that's an important uh, distinction given that um, agriculture represents about a third of total greenhouse gases emitted around the world. So there is an opportunity to not only facilitate healthy dietary patterns, but consider environmental outcomes in doing so. And I think pulses in some form can help be a driver of these initiatives by driving consumption of pulses, reducing risk factors of chronic disease, and then the inherent properties of pulses within agricultural systems in reducing greenhouse gas emissions from cereal-based cropping systems. And today, the focus that I'm really going to uh, um, talk about is the fact that peas and lentils um, have the ability to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere, deposit that nitrogen in the soil, and reduce the need for the application of synthetic nitrogen fertilizers in plant-based cropping systems. When we talk about sustainable diets, typically we use protein as the functional unit in sustainable diets, and um, I think that's an a, re a reasonable approach. This is data from Dr. Sabaté published in 2014. And we all know, this was, this was actually presented earlier, that the amount of energy needed to produce animal-based protein is far greater than plant-based protein. So obviously, when we talk about sustainable diets, we typically go to the displacement of animal-based protein in diets with plant-based protein sources. But I would argue that there are other opportunities to do so. And we can actually work on this continuum as well, looking at the effects of incorporating more pulses in cereal-based foods as reform with reformulation um, as a strategy. Things like pasta, cereal, um, and uh, bread that are typically dietary staples around the world, with wheat being uh, the primary cereal grain included in these foods. So just to give you an example, this is data from Canadian cropping systems for wheat and peas. And just to note that in the worst case scenario for wheat, where you have a monoculture system, or you have oil seeds preceding cereals, compared to peas, peas produce 43% less greenhouse gas emissions within a cereal-based cropping system. So the objective of this study was to systematically characterize the effect of using Western Canadian grown yellow pea and wheat flowers on nutrient density and carbon footprint in cereal-based foods. And in doing so in this analysis, what we did is we looked at nutrient density into the context of reformulation of cereal-based foods within the context of optimizing cropping systems. We use, uh, there should be a picture here of uh, bread. So uh, uh, we used um, uh, formulations produced by the Canadian International Grains Institute. These are actual formulations where refined wheat flour in bread, breakfast cereal, and pasta were displaced by whole yellow pea flour. These were actual products that were produced for functionality. So uh, the reason why, for the bread, for example, only 15% of the flour was displaced is because they wanted to make sure they could produce a bread that looked like bread, tasted, accept was acceptable to the consumer, 
and so on and so forth. So for the bread, a 15% inclusion rate of whole yellow pea flour. For the breakfast cereal, which was like a Rice Krispies type product, 53%. And for pasta, displacement of uh, durum semolina with 30% whole yellow pea flour. The first part of the study, we could have looked at, we want to look at nutritional analysis. We could have focused on protein, but given that pulses are nutrient dense, we wanted to use an aggregate score of nutrient density. We chose to use the nutrient balance concept, which was developed by Nestle and Adam Drudowski at the University of Washington. And it basically considers 27 qualifying nutrients to aggregate a score of nutrient density for the food. Next, we conducted a life cycle analysis for greenhouse gas emissions during each stage of production of uh, yellow pea and wheat from uh, production in the Great Northern Plains of Canada, looking at cultivation, milling, and manufacturing. And finally, what we wanted to do um, is we wanted to combine both nutrient density and greenhouse gas emissions of the food. So what we did is we, we uh, derived the nutrient carbon footprint score, which is essentially the ratio of nutrient density per unit sustainability. So results of the study demonstrated as expected with respect to the nutrient balance score, reformulation with whole yellow pea flour and staple cereal foods, increase the nutrient balance score by 11%, 70%, 18% across pan, bread, breakfast cereal, and pasta. And just to give you an idea around some of these uh, nutrients that were increased, um, for the pasta with that 30% displacement, we got a 150% increase in dietary fiber, a 14% increase in protein, a 63% increase in iron, and a 125% increase in potassium. Stemming from yesterday's conversation around protein, if we are going to displace animal-based protein with cereal-based products, it is important to evaluate protein quality of foods. And the, the, uh, using pro uh, cereal-based foods uh, with pulses actually lends the idea of complementary protein. So what we did is we did run the protein quality of these reformulated products using PD-CAS as our metric for uh, for protein quality, and as you can see, there was a 41% increase, 100% increase, and 111% increase for pan bread, pasta, and breakfast cereal on the reformulated product, and this transferred over into an increase in corrected protein within each food product. Regarding the effect of reformulation on greenhouse gas emissions, a reduction of 4%, 11%, and 13% respectively, and when we looked at the NCFS score, which is the nutrient balance concept, as a ratio to uh, the carbon footprint. Appreciate that you're getting an increase in the numerator, numerator and at the same time a decrease in the denominator. It drove an increase of 15, 90, and 35 percent. It is important to, um, to uh, note that with this study, this was actually the worst case scenario because all we did was drive an increase in nutrition or nutrient density and a decrease in greenhouse gas emissions from the addition of peas. But there's still an opportunity to optimize the contribution of an optimized wheat system to the reformulation. And we can do that by growing wheat in rotation with peas. And this is from the idea that peas and lentils are able to fix nitrogen and, and allow for the reduction of the application of nitrogen, synthetic nitrogen-based fertilizers to those cereal crops grown subsequent to peas. And this is, can be done two ways. The first is you just grow uh, wheat after peas, and you apply the same amount of nitrogen to the wheat as you would in this scenario. And what you do is you get a boost in yield, but it does reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from that wheat by 13%. Um, the best way to do it, but this will never happen in agriculture, at least today, is that you optimize the application of nitrogen fertilizer so you keep yield constant, and you get a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 64%. And when we go back to our greenhouse gas emission data, this can translate into significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions from the reformulation, going from 4 to 12 percent, 11 to 13 percent, and 13 to 21 percent, and then the further optimization in the past, for example, decreasing greenhouse gas emissions by around 51 percent. So the conclusions from this study are that reformulation with pulses is a viable strategy to help increase the nutrient density of cereal-based foods to align with dietary patterns that help to manage diabetes, decrease cardi cardiometabolic risk factors. Pulses can concurrently decrease the environmental footprint of cereal-based processed foods. And at the cultivation stage, nitrogen-fixing properties of pulses 
can be used to further decrease and optimize the carbon footprint of cereal cropping systems used to produce processed foods. Thank you very much.